A new home for youth services means new resources for young people in South Central Wisconsin and a new program for new leaders. New is next on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. A little later in the show, we will introduce you to the Madison chapter of the New Leaders Council and we'll talk about what it might mean for Madison. But we start with Youth Services of South Central Wisconsin, home of Briar Patch, the Madison Street Team, Youth Restitution Program, to name just a few, which recently opened the doors to its impressive new home. My first guest this morning is Youth Services Director Casey Barron. Casey, thank you very much. Well, good morning. Thank you Welcome for having us. Welcome to For the Record. Appreciate um, being here. You know, viewers are going to be familiar with one of your programs for sure. They may not know the breadth of programs that you offer, but why don't you just talk about the significance of the new move, sort of in, in, as an introductory point to what Youth Services of South Central Wisconsin really is. Sure. Well, Youth Services of Southern Wisconsin has been around really for 40 plus years um, through Briar Patch and formerly Community Adolescent Programs. We provide a, a plethora, as you suggested, of services for youth and families. So we recently, about three months ago, moved to our new facility on Rimrock Road. Um, we had been on Atwood Avenue for about 15 years in rented space, so this is our first foray into actually owning our own property. We're seeing a picture of it right now. Right now. Great yeah, it's, new building. It's a great new building, and one of the biggest um, benefits, there's two great benefits to us being there. Number one, it, we've more than doubled our programming space for youth and families. And number two, we have space in that building for uh, a very badly needed program in Madison that doesn't currently exist, and that's a temporary shelter for runaway and homeless youth. So there had been no temporary shelter like that? The, uh, going back 40 years, uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a temporary shelter for that population in Dane County. Many people think or th have thought in the past that Briar Patch had a shelter for youth, right. and they never did. People never stayed overnight at the Briar Patch facility when it was east on East Washington Avenue for many years. You know, unfortunately, uh, I I'm sure there are a lot of people who wouldn't readily recognize the need for a shelter facility. Yes, and right. there is. And, I mean, it's a significant need. It's a significant need. It's, and, you know, runaway and homeless youth, um, there is a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them in Dane County. They're sort of a hidden population. They try to stay out of the limelight. They don't want to be noticed. They don't want to be bothered. And it's really a hidden problem in our community. Uh, in the 2012 Dane County Youth Assessment, 859 high school students reported being kicked out of their home in the last 12 months. So then the question, the next question is, where did those 859 youth go? And unfortunately, some of them ended up on the streets, living in cars, staying with strangers in unsafe situations, that kind of stuff. But you're not likely to see them where we see typically homeless people downtown or in the adult shelters. They just tend not to go to those places. That's exactly right. Uh, the people that you're going to see downtown who are homeless are most often adults and most often single adults, though there may be some homeless families down there as well. Um, youth that are 17 or under and are homeless do not and cannot access the adult shelter system or the adult subsidized housing system. So they're really left out there with very few resources for safe um, living. Casey, one of the one of the great benefits of the of the 40 years that Youth Services has been here and the breadth of services offered is that you really see trends developing for young people, I think, before a lot of us do. What do we need to know about the state and health and welfare of young people in our community today? Yeah, unfortunately, during, since the crash, if you will, of the stock market in 2008, poverty levels have increased around the country. Uh, certainly in Dane County, they've increased, and I think Dane County actually leads Wisconsin in the uh, number of homeless, or I'm sorry, the number of uh, people living below the poverty line, um, or at least have had the greatest increases in that population in the last five years or so. So what we've seen is more youth uh, leaving home for a variety of reasons, uh, being kicked out of their homes, uh, running away from home. Sometimes there's pressure on young people to leave because the family's finances are very bad and the families really can't support them anymore from a financial perspective. So, so we've seen an up uptick in the number of youth on the streets, the number of youth needing shelter, uh, the number of youth who really don't have a safe place to stay at night. I think over the years we probably have isolated stories and glamorized them of young people 
striking out on their own, you know, finding their place, becoming yes. right. successful. The barriers to that are probably great and maybe greater now than they were. Is that accurate? I, I think you're correct when you say that. I mean, there and there are those stories, and, and every time I see one of them, it brings a smile to my face, but they're probably, those stories are the exception rather than the rule. If you think about a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old who's been kicked out of their home, really doesn't have any street sense or any marketable skills as far as trying to find employment, doesn't have a place to live, doesn't have any money to buy food, I mean, I, I would venture to say that many 18, 19 year olds, young people entering college would have a difficult time navigating that situation, much less a 15 year old who's really thrust out into the world on their own with no skill sets, uh, essentially, to make uh, a safe road for themselves yeah. forward. So if we talk about resources for homeless kids um, and, and Briar Patch, with, which a lot of people know about, I think. Um, Project Hugs, which is, you know has gotten some attention from time to time. Sure. The street team, intensive supervision. How do you describe youth services mission uh, with all of those different programs? Yeah, so, so you know a lot of people say, well, you've got court involved youth, you've got kids running away that are going to Briar Patch. How do those two mesh? I mean, why are you trying to do all that stuff together? And my answer to that is pretty simple. Underneath whatever those behaviors are or those problems are that kids are experiencing is just a kid, a young person who has, you know, hopes and dreams and fears and anxieties like all of us have. And there's, they have more in common, whether they're involved with the court and, you know, breaking law or running away from home, they have much more in common th than they do as far as having differences goes. So our, our approach is really, let's help this young person find a positive path forward. Let's give them some hope. Let's help them identify um, a way to become a, a productive, responsible adult in our community and we'll work with them and with their families to accomplish that mission. Um, so really we're about empowering kids and then subsequent to that empowering their families as well. How do they end up with you? How do they find you, Casey? They, they come to us in a variety of ways. Uh, some are referred by school staff, uh, Dane County social workers, some through law enforcement, some through word of mouth from other clients. Some just drop in because they heard about Briar Patch or Project Hugs or one of our other services. So really from a, a, across the spectrum as far as where our referrals come and, from. And I know this isn't probably a major source, but it seems to me I've met someone on your staff who actually will be out and if they see someone, yes. they say, yes. hey, maybe we can help. Yes, and thank you for reminding me about that. Uh, we do have a street outreach program that's been around for seven or eight years. And we actually send staff members out into the street in teams uh, two or three people at a time. Sometimes they're with a, it's a staff member to volunteer, but their mission is to identify young people, uh, both adolescents and young adults who are on the streets and in need of assistance, whether it be something to eat, a safe place to stay, a referral for medical care or dental care. And uh, we've been doing that for about seven or eight years. Very successful yeah. program identifies and they have identifies hundreds of young people uh, a year who need assistance and probably they touch the lives of 1500 to 2000 people every year. Yeah. All right, well we've got this nice new building. We're going to talk about what's in it and how it works. We come back right after this. My guest this morning, my first guest, is Casey Barron, the Executive Director of Youth Services of Southern Wisconsin. And we're talking about the new facility that is open on Rim Rock Road. Um, maybe you can just help us. How did, I mean, how did this, how did this come to be? Uh, these things don't just appear out of nowhere. Where did the money for this come from? They and, don't appear out of nowhere. Uh, so uh, back in the 2000s, or, I'm sorry, back in uh, the mid-2000s, uh, we merged with Briar Patch. Uh, there was a merger and the Briar Patch moved over, their staff moved over to our location on Atwood Avenue to join the rest of our staff. And then we sold the property on East Washington Avenue. The revenue from the sale of that property went into an account for future facility needs. Okay. And we were really outgrowing our space on Atwood Avenue. And also the Atwood Avenue space did not have any accommodations for that much needed youth shelter. So long story short, we use that money towards the purchase of property for the construction of the new facility and then we partnered with First Business Bank 
for the money to actually do the construction of the facility. Now, the first thing that pops to mind between Atwood and here is accessibility. Is there a bus out there? there I don't is, remember. There, there okay. is. The, the number 16 bus okay. from Madison runs right by our site, and there's a bus stop on either side of our building. Uh, we're only six blocks from the belt line, so it's very easy to find Rimrock Road's pretty well-known location. Now, everything is in there, but the shelter is not open yet. What do you what do you need to open the shelter? Well, the bottom line is we need money, Neil. We need sources of sustainable money to operate that program on a you know month to month and year to year basis. The the, the additional cost of operating the shelter added into our Briar Patch Runway and Homeless Youth Program is going to be about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Okay. So we'll need sustainable sources of funding. F annually for that three hundred fifty. Can you just give us an example of what that means, a sustainable force of money? Is it? A a, 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 yes. Is, a, I mean, is it government money or yeah, is it going to be private money? I mean, I think there'll be some private money, but I think by and large it has to be uh, government money from Dane County, the city of Madison, those types of sources. Yeah. Um, there will certainly be some private donations from individuals and some private foundations and some other type of grants that we use to help operate the shelter, but we need the city and the county to help to step up and help us make that a reality. And you've always had some private, I mean, regular private donations, yes. right? And yes. so that avenue is still open? And That avenue is absolutely open, and we are going to be conducting a fundraising fundraising campaign, excuse me, in the coming months. Uh -huh. And our goal for that campaign is not, number one, to secure some of the operating funds for the shelter, but also, just as important, is to pay off the mortgage on the property. And by paying off that mortgage, we'll free up some resources to operate all of our programs, including the shelter. Okay. So that's fundraising is going to be yet this year? Uh, starting later this year and moving into next year as well, yes. And then once the shelter's up and running, Casey, is that then everything's where you want it to be at that point? Yes. Um, that will bring all of our programs that we have planned to open uh, to fruition. Um, it's an eight-bed facility, so um, it's not a big facility, but that's uh, limited by state law for that population of young people. So, yes, that will complete, um, actually completely fill almost the building mm. we're in. You know, I mean, obviously part of what I'm thinking is that we would like to think that some of these problems are going to go away, but they, that, that can be wishful thinking. And as our population grows, I suspect the demand for services will continue to grow. Uh, I think that's a logical conclusion. I mean... I, I would love to put us out of business. I mean, that would be the ultimate goal is to put all of our services of right out of business. But of in reality, we just know that that's not going to happen. Unfortunately and sadly, there's always going to be a need. And, and we just want to make sure that that unmet need now is fulfilled for that population of young people. Okay. Casey Barron, thanks very much. I'm going to direct people to your Facebook page and to the information Great. on the website uh, if they want to help. Thank you very much for having when me. When we come back, we're going to talk about the new Leaders Council right after this. Several months ago, I got an email from former Mayor Dave Cheslevich, Citizen Dave, who uh, asked me if I would meet with a friend of his and talk about the work that this friend was doing. The friend was Luke Fazard, uh, who was interested in, in the next generation of leaders in our community. And we talked, Luke, and uh, it, it sort of became the new Leaders Council. It wasn't at the time. Correct. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and your interest in this and how this chapter came to be. Neil, thanks very much for having me, first and foremost. Uh, the, I'm originally from the Green Bay area, but moved back to Madison in the, kind of the 2012 time frame and recognized that there was a number of us kind of around my age and part of the millennial generation that was interested in developing their leadership skills and uh, contributing to their community and in particular, uh, setting themselves up for success later down the road. And, but they didn't necessarily see the, kind of the perfect outlet in order to kind of realize those goals. So we started kicking around the idea of forming a chapter of the New Leaders Council, which is a national organization of which there are 30 chapters from as far east as New York to as far west as the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we kind of reached out to the, the national group and said, would you be interested? And they were very eager to uh, kind of get their foothold in, in Wisconsin. And so for kind of from late 2013 to early 2014, I was a part of a group that formed a chapter right here in Madison. 
and we recently graduated our very first group uh, of cohorts um, in uh, about two weeks ago. So what did, what did the course look like? What 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 is the yeah it's program? It's it's five months of training, uh, one weekend a month, starting from January, ending in May. And the assumption, it begins with the, kind of the underlying premise that the fellows are really going to learn just as much from each other as they will from the curriculum itself. Sure. We were very, very conscious of recruiting and selecting a class that was reflective of the diversity of Madison, both demographically and professionally. So. We have lawyers, we have entrepreneurs, we have a lot of people from the tech sector that came together. And the one underlying kind of common attribute that each of them had was really a deep love for the state of Wisconsin and for Madison in particular. And so the training itself was uh, kind of ran the gamut from public speaking all the way to how do you form a coalition and that sustained itself over time. And the, the kind of intent was to equip each of the fellows with a set of skills that at the end of the training they would have that they would use to achieve whatever the goal they had which was start their own business or run for office or maybe even just become a, a leader in their community so for people who are familiar with the two organizations that just pop into my head leadership mm -hmm. greater madison and magnet how does the new leaders council complement or or differ from those organizations yeah I, I view them each of, as a compliment. They're, they're both Magnet and Leadership Greater Madison are fantastic organizations. I would say the one area where New Leaders Council puts probably a little bit stronger emphasis is around public policy and politics. Whether or not someone has an interest in running for office themselves, I think everybody recognizes that at least an understanding of the political process is important. And so we do, uh, uh, much of the training is around um, kind of what is the structure of government, both local, state, and even national, and how can one navigate that in order to achieve their goals, whether that be, uh, you know, professional or even just personal. Now, the website uh, would, um, it would suggest that NLC is probably, they would use the word progressive sure. in terms of politics. Is this a place that would be comfortable for a diverse range of political opinion? Absolutely. Okay. So I participated in the training myself way back in 2009 when I was actually living in Boston going to graduate school. And we had people of all political persuasions as part of that. Um, as uh, the term progressive is kind of generally vague enough and to really encompass people that I think more are just forward looking. So the ability to look beyond maybe just the next election cycle or the next year, but really think about, okay, where are we going as a community in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And let's have a constructive dialogue on how we can you know, rely upon each other and build upon what currently exists in order to achieve some common goals. Luke, do you find, is there an inherent frustration with politics the way it's currently, the game is currently played? Absolutely. Okay. I think the, uh, there's a common uh, sense of cynicism and a sense of throwing up people's hands in the airs and saying, geez, there's just no point. And, and part of the formation or the reasoning behind the new leaders council was to push back against that cynicism and give people an outlet and an understanding that you know if we work together and we have some of these you know, long-term objectives and goals that we can get past this kind of current stalemate and really move the state and its people forward. If we can you know call the first cohort for example one generation yep. um, is that a, a politically active generation are they voting is this something new as opposed to the generation before it how, how would you characterize it well the millennial generation just statistically is very civically engaged both from a voting perspective and also from a community and volunteer service um, so each of the 17 cohorts or fellows that went through this particular class very very much engaged in their community but really we're thinking along the lines of how can I become even more so how can I become a leader and um, help achieve the specific agenda items or, or policy goals that I have and so they while they possessed the underlying desire to make things better they didn't necessarily know how to go about doing it or um, really have the guidance to get from point A to point B. And so part of the New Leaders Council was to not only give them the, the skills in order to do that, but also to pair them with a mentor who either has achieved success in a particular career field or area that, of interest and have them serve as a coach for these young people and um, hopefully you know, continue to guide them throughout a long period of time as they uh, progress throughout their career. I don't think I've ever seen a generation, Luke, that just sort of 
willingly handed over leadership to another generation. I mean, yep. you, you're going to have to kind of go and grab it because it's just never easy. Right. Is there some appetite for that and preparation for that that, you know, you, you got to uh, yes. got to be aggressive here. I, I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah. And, and I, certainly, though, I think demographics are on our side a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the Department of Administration has uh, statistically shown that over the next about 20 years, the senior citizen population in Wisconsin, those over 65, is, is going to double. And with that, with the boomers retiring, there's going to be a wave of openings, uh, jobs in the, both the public and private sector. And so it's apparent that we uh, you know, deliver or, or build these, this next generation of leaders because whether we like it or not, there is going to be a changing of the guard from a generational perspective. And so I think it's important to have these conversations now and rather than uh, get to a point where we are left with a kind of a gaping hole in terms of leadership both on the, in the public and the private sector. Part of the expectation has always been, I think, with any leadership group to run, to, to run candidates for office. Mm -hmm. um, and yet in the system that is so dysfunctional right now as our current state and federal government, is there still an interest in running for office to change from within or is it more to uh, change independent of government right now? I think there's, a, a, there's an interest of, of both, but I do think in the light of the cynicism and the feeling that at particularly maybe at the state level that there is a little bit of a stalemate, that the interest is actually trickled down to the local government level. So people that may not necessarily have given thought to running for city council or county board or uh, you know something along those lines are now looking at that as a way that they can really impact their communities yeah. and are not caught up in the same kind of stalemates that are affecting other levels of government. We've just got 30 seconds left, Luke. How do people find you? Are you, you welcome people to contact you? And Absolutely. We've got a Facebook page. We've got a Twitter feed. Um, in this September, October time frame, we'll be recruiting for our next class of fellows, the class of 2015. There are still openings. Absolutely. So please reach out if you're interested. Um, otherwise, if you're interested in serving as a mentor, we're always eager to welcome people into the fold as well. And, and a class size, what, of about 20, did you exactly say? Exactly right. Yep, we cap it at 20, So, uh, we, but we are, are welcome from people from uh, the greater Madison area to go ahead and apply and be part of the organization. We'll follow up on this, Luke. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you, Neil. We're going to wrap up for the record right after this. My thanks to Luke and Casey. Next week, Zach Brandon talks about the Chamber of Commerce trip to Silicon Valley. We'll see you next Sunday.